Coming up, the man who once beat the devil with a fiddle. Country Music Hall of Famer Charlie Daniels looks back at his legendary career. Then, a devastating diagnosis. It just, everything changed. And a mother determined to save her baby. Okay, don't lose it. Seven Days Ablaze rolls on. This was like a celebration. On today's 700 Club. Devastation beyond imagination. The governor of Puerto Rico says it could be months before power is restored to that beleaguered island. Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico with high winds and floods that turned some streets into raging rivers. And in Mexico, a frantic search for survivors is still underway after that massive earthquake two days ago. George Thomas brings us this look at the aftermath of both of these terrible natural disasters. First responders are out on the streets of San Juan, Puerto Rico, after the strongest storm in 83 years slammed into the Caribbean island. Maria destroyed hundreds of homes, snapped trees, and as you can see, tore off roofs and dumped at least 20 inches of rain. The governor says his island is completely destroyed. Residents of the U.S. territory joined firefighters as they fanned out across the capital, clearing wood and debris from the streets. This is my apartment. First time I came, I come inside. This is very sad. As people took stock of the damage, officials are warning it could be months before power is restored on the island, with hotels, ballrooms, shelters and sports arenas quickly filling up with the homeless. Some are singing about finding strength through the storm. They'll need it as the recovery and cleanup slowly gets underway. The hurricane came ashore off Puerto Rico's northwest coast Wednesday, packing winds of 155 miles per hour, just two miles an hour under a Category 5. The storm regained strength as it moved back over open water, on course to slam into Turks and Caicos and the Dominican Republic. 2,300 miles west of Puerto Rico, this is the scene in Mexico City as emergency crews are still working tirelessly to find survivors following that 7.1 magnitude earthquake that struck the central part of the country. Over 40 buildings collapsed in the capital city. Operation Blessing, which has a significant presence in the country, responded soon after the earthquake struck Tuesday afternoon. Deploying people on motorcycles to distribute water and other essential supplies to some of the hardest hit areas of the city. Within a few hours, oh, no. hundreds got busy helping set up mobile kitchens and filling warehouses as they stepped up to meet the needs of their hurting neighbors. Local authorities also joined a human chain of Operation Blessing volunteers as they packed vital supplies bound for some of the outlying areas near the quake's epicenter. Everywhere we look, there are houses down, houses condemned, and there are families sleeping out in the elements. The Operation Blessing team brought a truckload full of tents and quickly set to work, erecting the temporary shelter for scores of families who had lost homes. 245 people have died so far, with Mexico City bearing the brunt of the deaths and damage. More than 2,000 were also injured. And so the need for help is great. George Thomas, CBN News. You know, I want to ask you, and I ask Wendy, can you imagine what you would be like if you had no power? You had no ability to have a refrigerator, no ability to have a microwave, no ability to have an electric oven, mm. no ability to have a, any kind of generation of power, no lights, no heat, no cold in the hot, hot you couldn't have any of those things. No, I've been, I've roughed it, but that would be roughing it to a place I'd never well, have gone before. You know, if you go on a camping trip, you've got, you yeah, know, you've got you, supplies, you've got, you've got food and water. Supplies, and you've got uh, comfortable sleeping bags and sleeping bags, yeah. And, and you've got tents, you've got you, but the average person doesn't have that. But to think of being without any kind of power at all for an extended period, just think of what it'd be like if your refrigerator doesn't work. Well, we're so used to having refrigerated food. All the food in your refrigerator will go, go stale, go uh, you know, rotten on you. I mean, it'd be terrible. 
Same thing in Mexico City with those awful disaster, uh, buildings falling down on people's heads and uh, relief agencies looking out for the poor and the needy. We need your help, by the way. Uh, Operation Blessing, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, we can help a lot of people, and we do. Uh, but every dollar is multiplied many times, sometimes three or four times, because we, we multiplied with working with other agencies. But folks, there is tragedy that is of unimaginable proportions, unimagined. And those poor people down in Puerto Rico, you know, it's just unbelievable uh, what they've been And through. some of the flash flooding images that are coming in from Puerto Rico, they're getting still, as we speak, lots and lots of rain on top of the, the no power. And, and, you, and of course, you can live without food for a few days, but water. And a lot of That's times right. when there's flooding, it contaminates the water supply. And so we've That's got right. to have water get to those people. So we, we have clean water. We bring them. We, we have uh, tarps for their uh, living. But it's just temporary. But it keeps keep them alive right. during this period of crisis. That's right. Well, here at home, some senators are trying to help churches who have suffered from natural disasters. John Jessup has that. Thanks, Pat. Unprecedented natural disasters have left many American churches damaged and in need of desperate repair. But current laws exclude houses of worship from receiving federal disaster relief from FEMA. So, so four senators, including James Lankford of Oklahoma, have introduced a bill to change the law so churches can be included among the nonprofits receiving federal aid. Lankford told CBN News why they're behind this measure. Churches have been denied FEMA aid, uh, which makes it very, very ironic. In my state, uh, you may have a tornado that comes through the middle of a town that destroys several homes, damages a church. That church, damaged though it may be, ends up being the shelter for quite a few folks or the food distribution network. But at the end of it, they have no access to the FEMA disaster funds. Everything else around them does. That doesn't make sense. Uh, the federal government cannot discriminate on someone simply based on the fact that they're a church. And since this is an urgent need, Lankford is hopeful the Senate will take up this bill quickly. Well, Congress will soon consider President Trump's top financial priorities, taxes and health care. And David Brody talked with one of the president's key point men on both issues, his budget director, Mick Mulvaney. When it comes to movers and shakers inside Washington, D.C., look no further than White House Budget Director Mick Mulvaney. He's not only the main number cruncher when it comes to the budget, he's a key participant in making sure President Trump's policy agenda gets to the finish line, and that includes tax reform and repealing Obamacare. Trending in the news lately is this big final push in the Senate on a bill to replace Obamacare. A vote is scheduled for next week. Mulvaney made an appearance on CBN's Faith Nation program on Facebook where he talked about the prospects. I think if you ask me how many votes it has as of today, 48, 49 maybe, um, which last time I checked is not enough. 50 is the threshold. The budget director is keenly aware that senators will be waiting to see the costs associated with the bill. A preliminary Congressional Budget Office report will be out next week. But Mulvaney says even if the CBO's numbers don't look good, that should matter. Uh, while their data is required, uh, it's been wrong a lot in the past. Mulvaney and the White House are also juggling tax reform. The big move to pass that is set for this fall. You think that there will be a bill on the president's desk, say, by the end of the year? I hope so. Um, that's still the president's top priority. If you've got w listeners watching this show or li uh, uh, viewers watching this show who are 30 years old, they've never had a job in a truly healthy American economy. And that's defined as 3% or greater. So we want to try and get back to that. And tax reform is a central piece of that, which is why we've been working so hard on it. No specifics on the plan yet, except that we know President Trump wants to see a much lower tax rate on businesses, down to 15%. That's the centerpiece, but is it non-negotiable? Nothing's set in stone in Washington, but if you ask the president what his priorities are on the tax reform bill specifically, that 15 percent rate is, is, is absolutely critical to us. Why? Um, because if we want to go back to that, that 3 percent economic growth, you have to have more investment in the, company, in, the, in the country. The way you drive GDP growth is a function of the number of people working multiplied by how productive they are. When it comes to Mulvaney's priorities for the federal budget, the one that gets the most high profile attention is the wall. I want to make it very clear that the wall absolutely continues to be a priority for the president. 
How to pay for it is another matter. The Trump administration wants $1.6 billion. Most Democrats don't want it at all. And even a decent sized group of Republicans aren't sure either. Trump's art of the deal will have to come into play, something Mulvaney saw for himself recently when the president cut a deal with the two top Dems in Congress, Chuck and Nancy. How concerned should conservatives be about what we're hearing so much about, this new bipartisan uh, Chuck and Nancy wheeling and dealing? He's not concerned at all. I think what you, what you see now is the president more interested in getting results. When you are the president and you're interested in passing an agenda, Maybe it's not that unusual for you to step back and say, OK, who can help me get this stuff done? As for that meeting with the president and Chuck and Nancy, he says he was right there in the room, had a front row seat for all of it. He calls it fascinating times and stories that he's going to tell his grandchildren about one day in the future. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, David. Pat, these are fascinating times indeed. They are indeed. You know, the Republicans have just got to get their act together. If they don't pass a couple of these major pieces of legislation, their period of ascendancy is over. They're going to lose majorities in, in, the, in the Senate and possibly in the House. They're looking at maybe even losing the presidency in the next, next go-around. They've got it all now. They have the Senate. They have the House. They have the White House. They have it all. And it's been given them to govern this country. And so the American people are saying, you guys get your act together. And these outliers like Lisa Murkowski and those who are opposing, for example, the repeal of Obamacare, the American people want the health care fixed. They want it fixed. And so I, I call upon the Republicans who are in charge of the government, fix the stuff, especially this tax cut. We need a tax cut. We need it. And don't listen to this nonsense about, well, let's not help the rich. Well, the truth is the job creators are the ones who have the capital to invest in businesses. So it may be that they're richer than others, but helping them or denying them benefits is not going to help the working people. The working people will get help when everybody is helped. Whew. So let's do it. Hey, we had a party last night. Did you, did you, I you was fun? there. You were oh, there. Was front row seats. It was. I, mean, I love our Rosh Hashanah celebrations. Did I say that right? Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Are off the charts. I mean, they're spectacular. And of course, we had Paul Wilbur there, and you spoke last night and talked about the uh, the meaning of Rosh Hashanah and the beginning of the Jewish New Year. And uh, you were there. I mean, the music was and the it dancing. Was fantastic. The dancing was well, beautiful. anyhow. Last night marked the start of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. That's the year 5778, 5778, for those keeping count. <laughs> at sundown, we here at CBN marked Rosh Hashanah inside the Regent University Chapel with music and a special performance from Messianic worship leader Paul Wilbur. Take a look at this. Last night in the Regent University Chapel, the sound of the shofar ushered in the Jewish New Year celebration, Rosh Hashanah. We look forward to the day where a shofar will blow from the mountain of the Lord our God, and the King of Kings will come back for his bride. Paul Wilbur led the celebrants in worship through song and dance. Lifting our voices and giving God the praise. He is ascending as our praise arises. He is lighting, He's descending on those praises and He's scattering our enemies. The night was a joyous celebration of God's goodness and faithfulness. The trumpet of the Lord will sound and time will be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saints of earth are gathered over on the other side, here's what I'm singing, and when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Well, we had a party. That was great. And at the very end, they let 
some of us in the audience get up on stage and dance too. And I, of course, I was right there. Oh, yes, I was. you were doing it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. I missed that. that was <laughs> it was fun, but uh, yeah. The whole thing was wonderful. Mm. All right. Well, coming up, he's had a career that spans six decades and capped it off last year with an introduction into the Country Music Hall of Fame. We're, of course, talking about Charlie Daniels, and he joins us live next. Oh, he sold millions of albums, one of the most popular. Just got inaugurated into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And it's such a pleasure to have a dear friend back with us on the 700 Club, Charlie Daniel. Pat. God bless you, man. God bless you, sir. Good to be with you today. Thank you very much. Well, I'm so glad to see you. Been a while. It has. Now, listen, you, you started out. You didn't know anything about music, did you? Did no, you? sir, I didn't. I don't. I still, to this day, don't read music. I never had lessons. I just, Come on. Yeah, no. I had a friend. It was funny. I had a friend that I had no idea had a guitar. I don't know where he got it from or how long he had it. Yeah. I went up to his house one day, and he was playing. He knew about two and a half chords, literally. Yeah. And I got him to teach me those, and then we started, kind of started from there. And I've been, been at it ever since, but I still never took time to learn how to read music. Well, did you, I mean, how did you pattern yourself? Was it was it the Grand Ole Opry or something like that? Yeah, basically the people on the Grand Ole Opry. And I got into bluegrass for a good little while, Bill Monroe and Flatten Scruggs yeah. and those people. I went through different phases. But, you know, when I was a kid, Pat, the radio stations were not formatted for one kind of music. They played all kinds of music. They'd start sure. off in the morning with country, then they'd play some for the ladies that were home. And then the kids come home, they'd play whatever the popular music of the day was. And I was exposed to so many different kinds of music coming up, and I loved it all. So yeah. when I sat down and started doing my music, I started, uh -huh. I, I just mixed it all together. So that's kind of what I, my style is, is a, a little bit of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Call it eclectic, yeah. whatever. Um, well, you, you uh, started writing music. Well, when did you start writing? You've written a lot of songs. I basically, I started writing pretty early on, but I wrote some just really bad, trite type stuff, you know, until I got with a, with a guy by the name of Bob Johnston. Yeah. And I started writing with him, and he, he if anybody has ever mentored me, or, or he was the guy that brought me to Nashville and spent a lot of time with me about, you know, writing and, mm -hmm. and not settling for less than what you were capable of. We spent hours and hours together doing writing songs, and so I got seriously involved in really writing about 1962. What's the secret of having a hit of song, a really popular song? What's I can't secret? say. If I did, I'd do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but the secret remains unfound. Uh, <laughs> all you can do is the very best you can. You know, is is you. You just have to go for it. If you've got something you feel good about, you just you can't make the people buy it. You can't make the radio stations play it. But you just put it out there and hope, you know. And that's basically. What was the big was the big breakthrough you had with writing? The big break for me writing was in 1962. Bob and myself wrote a, a song called "It Hurts Me" that Elvis Presley recorded in 1963. Yeah. That was my first intro into anything to do with national hits and that sort of thing. Well, it's a big deal if Elvis took oh, your song. Oh, it was a huge deal. You know, it was a, it was a single. It came out as a single. It was on the flip side of a movie song he had called Kissing Cousins. But uh -huh. it made no difference in those days with Elvis because they'd play one side for a while and they'd flip it over on the other side. Right. So it, it, it has been... It, it was my entree into the lots of, you know, different... Oh, you wrote Elvis Presley song. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, some of the others, you had, a, you had a couple other really, really big hits. Uh, we had uh, we had a song called The Devil Went Down to Georgia in yeah. 1979 that is uh, has been a our signature song, you could say, for all this time. Every, every time we play, we have to play that song because it's what people expect us to do. But we've had others, too. We've, we've done somewhere around 20 million albums, I guess, altogether. 20 million is a lot of people buying it's, a lot of much. records. <laughs> I've been at it a long time, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like traveling around the bus? The early days, you, you had a broken down uh, van, and you, 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 it was, you were all smelly together in that yeah, bus. Yeah, yeah. It was hard. <laughs> it was. Well, I first started traveling in a car, you know, with, and, and as we got more instruments and everything, we had to add the trailer, and then we got a van. Uh -huh. And, you know, you got six people, and, uh, you know, we had two, van had two vans for a while, one for the instruments, one for us. But then one day we got an old 
scenic cruiser bus. Uh -huh. When I say old, I mean something that Greyhound had already put five million miles on it before <laughs> we ever got a hold of it. And it broke down every 1,200 miles, but we loved it. It had bunks in it. It had been outfitted for a band to play in. And we could hold the instruments down in the bay. And uh, that was my first introduction to a bus. And I've been traveling the bus. Of course, we've upgraded a few times yeah, since then. Sure. I've traveled on a bus ever since. And my wife and myself travel on a bus now together. It's home for you us. Do. The two of you. We're able to be together. Yeah, 1983, my son started college. She's been traveling with me. I had a bus out theater for us. She's been traveling with me ever since. And by the way, I was married 53 years yesterday. Congratulations, Charlie. 53. And your wife has put up with all that? She's put up with it. And you, you, you're, you're saying it facetiously, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a sweet lady. Yeah. You know, well, you have been known for your faith, though, your belief in God. The devil went down to Georgia that was sort of Christian-based. How long have you known the Lord? You know, I, ha I, wrote, a, I wrote a chapter in, uh, in my book about my faith, and it was the hardest chapter for me to write uh -huh. because I really did a lot of uh, soul searching and looking at what I really honestly believed in, what my basic core beliefs were and how, how I came to them. I was awfully confused about, about salvation for a long time. I went to a lot of different churches. I went to... Mm -hmm. And one of the basic things that I stress is I heard so much about the condemnation of God and so yeah. little about the love. And I, I think a lot of real well-meaning pastors think a lot of times because they are a, they're way ahead of the curve mm -hmm. themselves and they think that people know all about salvation and how it applies to them personally when they walk through the door. And a lot of people don't. I didn't. Yeah. I believed I, all my life I heard Jesus died for your sins. I believed it, but I didn't know why. I didn't know why it was necessary. So I decided several years ago, I'm going to sit down and read the Bible for myself. Uh -huh. I'm going to take my opinion that I come up with and people like yourself, whose opinion I respect and listen to, and I'm going to, I'm going to walk that lonesome valley, as the song goes, and, uh -huh. and work out my, my own salvation. It's just been a kind of, I, I never had a, a Damascus Road experience. It's just been a kind of a recognizing the truth, you know, as, as the, and, and things keep, it, I'm a work in progress. I mean, things, things keep, sure. things keep, uh, you know, th things keep dawning on me. But like when I sit down and read, you know, if, if you confess with your mouth, mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that in John three sixteen, and uh, I just I constantly say those things to myself, and I, I believe that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God, mm -hmm. that uh, He came to Earth, that He was nailed to a cross for my sins, that He left here, He ascended, he's and He's going to descend one of these days. He's going to come back and pick yeah. us up. Well, that, that, that's take a, us to a better place. That's about as thorough as you could get. <laughs> You, you wrote something in your book, Don't Count the Empty Seeds. Talk yes. about that. Well, that, everybody wants to know about that title. When you're a young musician and you're just starting out, you play anywhere for anything to anybody. Yeah. If you're serious about it, and uh -huh. I was serious about it, and you're going to have a lot of empty seats because nobody knows who you are. You know, you'll be playing somewhere and a few people will come see you just out of curiosity. Uh huh. And if you go in and say, gosh, I got a half house tonight. I'm just going to take it easy. You know, that's the wrong attitude. That is a disastrous attitude. You play, you're not concerned with the empty seats. You're concerned with the, the seats that have people in them. Yeah. And if you please them, if you do a good enough show for them, the next time you come back, they'll come back, they'll bring somebody else with them and so on. It kind of reaches the exponential factor. And the first thing you know, you're, you're drawing crowds. You've, you're built a following. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's all about. Don't never look at the empty seats. Always look at the full seats. I Entertain like them. I like that. What's next for you? you? You've got another Hall of Fame. You've sold 20 million albums. That's a lot of work. Well, what are you doing next? I'm still doing the same thing. Same um, thing? Yeah. I never knew I could write, Pat, up to the last few years. I, it's, a, it's a talent God gave me that I didn't really know about. I mean, I knew I could put words together for a song. One day, one of the guys that worked with me said, you write story songs. Why don't you write stories? And I got thinking. I think mm -hmm. I'll give that a shot. So I, walked, I was on the road one day. I walked in a motel room and started writing short stories. So, yeah. And it just kind of went on from then. And I wrote this on this book here for... 
for 20 years. Yeah. But I could never find a place to stop it. I was in my 70s before I was ever (laughs) invited to join the Grand Ole Opry, you know. But interesting things kept happening to me, kept happening. So I kept writing and writing. But when I found out I was going to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, I thought, what a great place to pause this. Yeah. What a great place to you know to stop. So, I went the, to the ceremony that that night. Was inducted. Mm-hmm. Went home the next morning. Sat down and wrote my impressions of the induction and what it meant to me and everything. And kind of back wrote to where I was. And there was the, there it was. Here's a book. Finally finished. Yeah. Never look at the empty seats, Charlie Daniels. What a, a towering figure in country music, and a towering Christian who we appreciate and love. Charlie, you're the greatest. God bless you, buddy. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Charlie Daniels, great man, tremendous uh, musician, and a lot of fun. The devil went down to Georgia. You might like to listen to it. Wendy, what you got? Classic. And Charlie, don't worry. We're all a work in progress. God bless you. Thanks for being with us. Well, Charlie's also going to be our special guest at our All Staff Chapel later today. And you can watch that online at CBN.com at noon Eastern time. Coming up, it's going to be time for your questions. Honest answers. One viewer says, my husband admits that his vow to be with me forever was a lie. Am I bound to stay married to him? That weighs in on that and much more when we come back. Welcome back to the 700 Club, and it's time for your questions and some honest answers. This viewer writes in, when I married my husband, I made a vow to God to be with him forever. He made that vow, but admits it was a lie. Am I bound to stay married to him? He has done lots of things that are despicable, and I can't love him anymore. What does God say about that? That. Well, uh, God says that marriage is forever, but um, I, I don't know, you know. As a lawyer, we have a term called fraud in the inducement. Fraud in the inducement. And if there was fraud in the inducement, the contract doesn't uh, pertain because you were induced to enter into a contract under fraudulent uh, premises. Um, I I tell you what, your, your husband has done despicable things, you said. Does it despicable mean that he's having uh, affairs with people? If he does, adultery is a ground that we know for sure. Um, this whole matter of marriage and divorce is really a difficult problem that people are dealing with today, and it is so uh, pervasive. I don't think getting married is a contract to enter into a life of torment and torture. Mm. It should be a joyous experience. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, but has God joined you together? Uh, You said there was a lie in the inducement. When you first got married, your husband was lying to you. He's now done, quote, despicable things. What does that mean? I don't know what what you mean by despicable. Uh, If if it includes uh, fornication, if it includes adultery, then that's a clear scriptural ground. I don't know what else they are You'd have to tell me more that I could give you a, a clear answer on. All right. It doesn't sound good, though. <laughs> it doesn't sound, sound What good. a horrible marriage. Horrible guy. I don't like him. Well, I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, you don't like him? I don't know him, but I don't like him. <laughs> anyway, well, right. God help him. That's all I'm going to say. Right. All right. Katie writes in, I have been told recently from another Christian that it is possible to lose your salvation after you accept Christ if you turn away from God and sin against him. I have an uncle that came into a relationship with God, but turned away from his Christian faith and now is into Eastern spirituality. Did he lose his salvation? What do you have to say about this? Um, The Bible says that if somebody apostatizes, um, there is no more uh, salvation for them. Uh, Is your uncle committing apostasy? It sounds like he is. He's turning his life, I mean, he's turning his back on Jesus. He's counting the blood of Christ as a a despised thing, and he's turning to this Eastern religion. Uh, It isn't for me to say whether he has lost his salvation or not, but I will say he's in danger of it. And uh, can he lose it under those circumstances? Absolutely. You know, I know somebody who 
went off, was a Christian, then went off to the New Age for about yeah. a year, lived yeah. in a commune, yeah. and came back, because the husband never stopped praying for the wife, came back stronger than ever. So there is hope, oh, at least. Of course But Absolutely. yeah, but if, like you said, if you turn your back, it's not going to If you turn matter. the back on the Lord, but <clears throat> yes, there's always hope. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <All right. clears throat> okay, Vinny says, I have forgiven my dad for my childhood traumas. Why do I still face depression and anxiety? What exactly would cure me? <laughs> you know, I hate to tell you, I'm not a psychiatrist, and, and I have to get to know you better to tell you what's wrong with you. Uh, those early traumas, I don't know what your father did to you, uh, but the biggest thing in your life is to forgive. You know, when you stand praying, the Bible says, if you have ought against any, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. If you want to enter into the power of God, forgive the trauma that your father created. Whatever he did to you, and I don't know what it was, whatever it was, you forgive him because you're not hurting him by having a grudge in your heart, but you are hurting yourself. Okay. All right. Charlotte says, I was recently invited to a startup church, and during the service, I was introduced. The pastor said that there are things I'm going to do within the church. That grabbed my attention, yet it was my first visit, and I felt pressured. He also preached that it is a sin not to come to church. Is this true? Well, look, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together, but is it a sin not to go to church on Sunday morning? I don't see that it is. Uh, assembling together is whatever. Uh, coming together in the Lord and uh, not showing up at that man's church, I think that he has a revelation about you that may be a fault, faulty. Uh, I don't think you need to order your life after the, the revelation, so-called, of somebody else. Mm. You know, God will give you, he knows how to speak to you. He knows who you are, where you live, and what your name is. And he can speak to you clearly. So let him talk to you. Don't let somebody else tell you what you're supposed to be doing. I think that's very important. I think that's good advice. Thank Excellent you, advice. I well, that was some great questions, and we all got right, some well, honest yeah. answers. All right, time. That's all the honest answers that I've got for today. All right, what's next? <laughs> what's next? All right, well, in one Indian village, a baby named Thanvish was starving, and none of her neighbors were willing to help. They thought Thanvish was cursed because she was born with a cleft lip. Take a look. When Thanvish was born with a cleft lip and palate, her parents knew their neighbors would blame them. In our village, they say if you're pregnant and cut vegetables during a solar eclipse, then your child will be born with a cut on his ear or lip or hand. After she was born, my heart broke when I saw her cleft lip. I knew she would have a hard life. Thanvish couldn't drink from a bottle, so they fed her with a spoon. She barely got any milk that way, so she was always malnourished and sick. She choked and coughed a lot and threw up the little milk she could drink. She had fever all the time. It made me so sad. Thanvish's dad works as a day laborer and could never save enough for surgery. I considered selling myself as a bonded slave to someone. That is the only way I could get the money for my daughter's surgery. When CBN learned about Thanvish through the hospital, we said we would pay for the baby's surgery. Soon, she got the operation she so desperately needed. We were very happy. She looked so pretty. Not long after the operation, Thanvish was back home and eating well. She used to be sick all the time, but not anymore. No more choking or coughing and no fever. CBN helped us so much when we were in need. I want to say a big thank you to them. Oh, that is just so precious. And listen, if you're a CBN partner, you're a part of that. How much does it cost? I'm glad you asked. Just 65 cents a day. $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBN partner. And trust me, when we all get together and give together, it goes a long way. You can make a big difference. And as you know, there are a lot of hurting people that need our help right now. When you join, we have something for you. Pat's new teaching called Ask Anything, Biblical Answers to Some of Life's Most Perplexing Probing Questions. This is fascinating. You will get so many 
there's so many questions on here that you won't be expecting and answers that you may not be expecting. We want you to have it. It's our gift when you give us a call right now and just say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. The number right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. It's toll free. Give us a call right now and just say yes. Well, still ahead, a woman who was told to abort and instead issued a prayer call that was heard around the world. I had people all the way in Israel. I called everybody that I could think of. There's a lot of people on that list that are praying for this, this baby. So I need a miracle. Watch how those prayers were answered when we come back. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. North Korea says President Trump's threats won't stop them from moving forward with their nuclear program. In a speech at the United Nations Tuesday, President Trump said the U.S. would be forced to, quote, totally destroy North Korea if attacked. But North Korea's foreign minister said if the United States thought they could scare us with the sound of a, quote, barking dog, that's a silly dream. Well, a British supermarket is the first in the world to let shoppers pay for their purchases in a new way with the veins in their fingertips. The London Telegraph reports that customers at the Costcutter store in London can use a high-tech finger vein scanner. And the company behind that technology says it's in serious talks with other major UK supermarkets who are interested in using the scanners in thousands of other stores. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, Wednesday marked the halfway point of our seven days ablaze celebration, and it was also the first day of the Jewish New Year. So at our All Staff Chapel yesterday afternoon, we made sure to pray for you, our CBM partners, and also our friends over in the state of Israel. Here's some highlights from that service featuring singer Paul Wilbur. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, we all need to come in the same narrow gate. Whoever is willing to take off all that stuff, get on your face and go through that little narrow door, y'all come. We've been given such a privilege, such an honor. And can we believe God enough to get beyond what I need and how I feel and what I think? Can we, can we get that beyond that to how do you feel? What do you say? What do you think? I invite you to stand and we're just gonna pray together. Lord, we're willing to take off all the stuff to go through that little door that in our weakness, you would be seen as great. And in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of all peace. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. That is some good preaching right there. We have been so blessed this week. We have some, have some phenomenal speakers and musicians. Paul Wilbur, one of our favorites here at CBN. Well, if you want us to pray for you, give us a call. Our number is on your screen. It's toll free, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com and leave your request there. We also want to invite you to this afternoon's prayer service. You can stream it live on our website at noon Eastern, and it's Charlie Daniels. He's our featured speaker. And remember, Charlie's book is available. It's called um, Never Look at the Empty Seats. I love that title. It's available wherever bookstores, wherever books are sold in bookstores. Uh, available October 24th. All right, well, Jennifer Skogie needed a miracle. At an 18-week ultrasound, she was told her baby had problems with her heart and her brain. So Jennifer did the only thing she knew to do. She opened her Bible, called some friends, and launched a prayer battle for her child's life. I felt defeated and I, I told my husband, I just, I don't think I can do this anymore. You know, it's not worth it. Jennifer Sko and her husband Chris were ready for another baby after they had twins in 2010. But one pregnancy after another miscarried 
and Jennifer was ready to give up. And I lost a total of four pregnancies after the twins were born. And it was just so traumatic and devastating. Doctors had tried everything. So when she got pregnant a fifth time, they decided to do things differently. I literally had a conversation with God. God, I'm doing things completely different this time and completely 100% leave it up to you and just trust you. We've tried following the doctor's prescriptions and suggestions, so um, you know, I think we we're at the point, if, if God wants this to happen, then, then he'll let it happen. When Jennifer made it past 11 weeks, they knew their prayers had been answered. She couldn't wait for her 18-week checkup. I figured we'll get a nice clear shot of the baby on an ultrasound. I could put it in the scrapbook. We'll probably be confirmed at this point if it's a boy or a girl. Sure, you know, sign me up. They were disappointed that Chris, a police officer, had to work the day of the appointment. Jennifer decided to go anyway. I'll go and I'll do it and then I'll surprise you. I'll, you know, we'll do like a gender reveal and I'll let you know and everything will be fine. You don't need to take off work. You know, you see the baby up on the big computer screen. She's looking up all the parts. She's doing the measurements and... But when she got up to the head section, I can tell that her demeanor, it just, everything changed. The ultrasound technician left to get the doctor. And he said, I'm really sorry, I have to tell you this. Your baby has very severe birth defects. I'm laying there telling myself, okay, don't, don't, don't lose it. You gotta ask questions. He told Jennifer that parts of the baby's brain were missing and fluid was building up in the empty cavity. He added that the baby's heart wasn't developing properly. What am I facing here? And he said, basically, with the amount of defects and the severity of them, it would be very, very likely that you would lose the baby before you delivered. The doctor recommended she terminate the pregnancy. Jennifer refused and went home to tell Chris. I was just more devastated and just exhausted and just mentally and physically, just emotionally <laughs> beat and drained. Seeing how it affected Jen, that's probably the hardest thing to deal with. Despite the report, Jennifer and Chris stood on the decision she made from the start. I said that I wasn't going to rely on doctors and that I was going to rely on God. I just prayed. I went through the Bible and any verse that just popped out and looked like it was relevant or was inspirational or just something to grasp onto, I would print that out on my computer and I would tack it to my wall. Jennifer was especially drawn to Matthew 18, 19. You said it, God, it's in the Bible. So, all right, I'm gonna believe it. By now, they knew they were having a daughter and named her Lynette. Jennifer and Chris posted on social media and called friends, family, and their church asking for prayer. I had people all the way in Israel. I had people everywhere praying for this pregnancy. I called the 700 Club. I. I called everybody that I could think of. And so I'm like, okay, that is definitely more than two people right there. God, there's a lot of people on that list that are praying for this, this baby. So I need a miracle. Jennifer's medical care was transferred to Hollywood Presbyterian. As doctors monitored the baby's development, they started making some baffling discoveries. We went to the doctor and he was doing the ultrasound of her head. And he's like, oh, I see some more of her brain back here. <laughs> like, here's her brain, it's, it's back here. All of a sudden, miraculously, she had more of her brain. This was like a celebration. And we were telling our friends, everybody, you know, everybody was just thanking God, oh, you know, praise you, Jesus, thank you so much. They continued praying. And on June 13th, 2013, baby Lynette was born with a perfectly normal brain. Still, doctors suspected that the baby would need surgery to repair her heart and transferred her to Los Angeles Children's Hospital. 
After testing, doctors found nothing wrong. So you're telling me my child that was going to possibly die before I gave birth or soon after is completely normal. It was just an answer to many, many, many prayers. Today, Lynette has no problem keeping up with her brother and sister. I don't think the doctors missed anything. I think they saw what they saw. I think they were seeing what they were trained to look for. I just think it was a miracle. I literally am walking proof. My child is walking proof that God does still do miracles. You just got to open your mind and your heart and have faith and you'll see them. They're right there. And it is not the doctors. It is not science. It is God. And you have to give him the glory. God does still do miracles today. And you definitely want to give him the glory when it happens. What a beautiful story. And instead of focusing on the problem and what the doctors were saying, although we love our doctors and we respect them, they focused on how big God was. They focused on that God says, I am the God who performs wonders. I'm the God who still does miracles today. I haven't changed. That's what God says. A lot of people say, oh, miracles, that was for the Bible. That's, you know, back when Jesus turned the water into wine. That doesn't happen anymore. No, it happens every single day. And if you're watching right now and you need a miracle, God is the God who performs miracles. And I just want you to start crying out to him and start thanking him that your miracle is on the way. Here are some people that definitely need miracles healing of uh, this person needs healing of a compression fractures and a collapsed vertebrae blurry vision to be healed yes lord salvation for my homeless cousin who suffers from ptsd lord touch this person right now my sister's left leg to be restored and strength to walk confidently yes lord you will give us strength for our days god to give me strength and comfort for my my two adult daughters died this past past may 12 days apart lord we cry out right now for comfort for this person, this mother or father that needs, um, needs comfort for this, and that my husband be healed of spinal stenosis pain and, all, and Alzheimer's disease. So many people, if you need a miracle, I just want to agree with you right now. Father, we thank you that nothing is too hard for you. Whatever you are going through, today is your day. Believe it, receive it. God loves you, and he is the God who performs miracles. But well, we leave you with these words from Psalm 30. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. We'll see you tomorrow from all of us here at the 700 Club. God bless you and remember, God loves you.